it's the little things. You know? That's how I feel. We things can make a big difference. You can make someone happy just by smiling at them. <laughs> a cheerful face makes others cheerful. I'm Margaret Sinclair, but people call me Maggie Ann. My mum Libby, my dad Andrew, the neighbours in our tenement flat in Blackfriars Street, and of course I was Maggie Ann to my brothers and sisters. There were eight of us. Well, my brother James and my sister Mary went to heaven early, but we always counted them too. We got on well most of the time, but you know families. <laughs> there wasn't much room in our tenement flat in Blackfriars, but the boys had one room and the girls had another, and mum and dad slept in a recess in the kitchen. Ugh. The toilet was outside. <laughs> but that's how it was for people in those days. People didn't have much. I was always closest to my sister Bella. Oh. We were like peas in a pod. <laughs> we did everything together. Lots of people thought we were twins. We would even dress alike. Most of the time we would make our own outfits. Mum had taught us to sew at an early age. We had lots of fun doing that. I remember making a dress for my wee sister Lizzie for our first communion. I'd worn it to my first communion when I was 10. I think that was the happiest day of my life. But I fixed it up for her and she looked great in it. Like a wee angel. <laughs> Although, she wasn't always a wee angel. <laughs> Bella and I had lots of fun together. Dancing and games. And we helped each other out with chores around the house. <laughs> the neighbours couldn't tell us apart, except for the fact that I was the one who was always laughing. <laughs> we went to school at St Anne's. It was run by the Sisters of Mercy. I liked school. Well, I liked learning. And I wasn't bad at my studies. But I was quiet and a wee bit shy. The teacher seemed to like me. I remember Margaret Zinkler. A pale-faced, large-eyed little mouse with a sweet expression. I wasn't the cleverest pupil, but I did try and help others with their studies. I mean, after all, isn't knowledge a gift? I was able to help Bella with her reading and sums. Put down the one and carry the two. See? I was a pretty average pupil, but where I really shone was games and sports. Oh, I loved all that. We would run and go swimming. Oh, it's good to be fit and healthy and look after our bodies. But my favourite game of all was Diablo. <laughs> you get two sticks tied together with a piece of string and a big yo-yo thingy and you toss it up in the air and make it spin. Oh, Mum would watch me from the window in our tenement flat. Look at me Mum! Margaret, will you come in and help me with the dinner? Yes, yes Mum! You don't have to ask, just tell me and I'll help you. At home, I was kept busy. Well, what do you expect with a big family? We all did our bit to make the family life work. But we all had a touch of the Sinclair temper. And I had to work really hard at controlling mine sometimes. Sometimes you just had to bite your tongue and change the subject. Or go into another room to cool off. And sometimes you had to be the first one to say sorry, even if you're not entirely to blame. 
A wee prayer for patience usually helps. We're all poor souls without God after all. Our wee brother Andrew was almost always with us. <laughs> Much to Bella's dismay sometimes. Well, our brother John didn't really want him hanging around when he was playing football with his friends, so he would tag along with us. Looking after little brothers and sisters is important. We shouldn't just leave them out the fun just because they got on our nerves. Mum and Dad were good to us. They worked hard to bring us up. Mum came from Dundee. She used to work in a juke factory. That's the stringy stuff you find on the backs of carpets and you make bags from. Dad fell in love with her when he came up looking for work. <laughs> she followed him to Edinburgh and he followed her into the Catholic Church. They got married and, well, the rest is history. Dad worked as a road sweep and Mum looked after us. We were a big family and there wasn't much money around, so I'd try and help out as much as I could. Sweeping the stairs, helping my sisters tidy our room, give a hand with the cooking, polishing the brass work and wax polishing the furniture. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I never let on, but I really hated doing the brass work. I always said that if I had my own place, there'd be no brass in it. <laughs> Sometimes mum would get sad and I'd try and cheer her up. We all need cheering up sometimes, especially those that we look up to or rely on, like our parents or our teachers or priests. When mum got really sad, sometimes she'd turn to drink. Lots of people did that then. People found it hard to make ends meet and they'd find comfort in drinking. At the weekends, you could hear drunk people in the streets shouting and throwing bottles. People got up to all kinds of bad stuff in the tenements. We mustn't judge them. We don't know what they're going through. I would pray for them. If only they knew how much God wanted to help them and how much he loved them. Mum would sometimes turn to me and say, Oh Maggie, what would I do without you? Sometimes I wonder why I was born at all. Life is so hard sometimes. Then you worry Mum. There really are no bad days. Only opportunities to get better living. Despite her struggles, Mum had a great faith. She taught me a very valuable lesson. Place everything in God's hands and offer up all your little sufferings. We'd pray the Rosary as a family and sometimes we'd pray the Angelus. Our Lady had a very special place in our home and I realised soon that Jesus was very important in my life. He seemed to be telling me don't worry about anything. Just place your trust in me and everything will be all right in time.
at the age of 14, I left school and started work as an apprentice French furniture polisher. Polishing furniture is a particular skill, you know. There's more to it than you might imagine. It takes a lot of patience. There. Perfect. <laughs> you can almost see your face in it. My sister Bella and I went to work at Schoolman's Weaverly Cabinet Works. People left school early in those days. I was working five and a half days a week. I learnt the satisfaction of an honest day's work, earning three and six a week. Sometimes we had to move heavy tables around, carrying them on our backs. <laughs> Good job I kept myself fit. The extra money from Bella and I came in handy for Mum and Dad. We were able to buy some new furniture, oh, and best of all, a sewing machine. We had some great fun with that. I liked fashion. We weren't well off, but I did like to dress up for the dances. And why not? I wasn't interested in perfume or makeup. But I did like to dress nicely. It was a time of change in my life. I was becoming a woman. And the world around me was changing. It was 1914 and a great world war had begun. My dad Andrew and my eldest brother John were called up for service in the army. John was sent to Egypt. My dad's health meant that he didn't have to do time in active service. Nevertheless, I remember writing letters to him for my mum. My punctuation or spelling wasn't brilliant, but mum couldn't read or write. <laughs> I remember him teasing me. <laughs> Maggie Ann, I think you might have missed out a full stop. You ended this letter with, God keep you from your loving wife. <laughs> Dad was always a hard worker. He started off as a tanner when he came to Edinburgh with Mum, but soon became a road sweep for the city council. Oh, that was hard work. He was out to all kinds of hours and all kinds of weather. I tried to follow his example of working hard and offering it up to God. You don't have to be on your knees all the time to be praying. When I was 17, I moved to the Scottish furniture stores as a fully fledged French polisher. Then a year later, I went to the civil service stores where I polished the furniture and welcomed the customers. That was good experience. I loved people. And the smallest act of kindness can make all the difference. I tried to follow the little way of my favorite saint. Saint Therese, the little flower. She says that little things done well are like gifts to God. Those were special years. I had work to fill my days and music to fill my nights. <laughs> my social life was developing. So was my spiritual life. The two just seemed to go hand in hand. A healthy relationship with God and a healthy relationship with people. Oh, Bella and I went to the dances in the parish. Oh, how I love to dance. <laughs> I was in my prime, and when it came to ladies' choice, I would always look for the person who'd been left out the fun. I was a happy, young Catholic woman. I loved to dance, and I loved the pictures. Especially Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> Be 
being part of the church was part of my normal everyday life. I was in all sorts of groups growing up. My relationship with Jesus meant everything to me. The Eucharistic adoration, usually during my lunch hour. And I was a member of the Handmaids of the Blessed Sacrament. <laughs> I wore my badge with pride. I even put it on my overalls at work. I wasn't trying to push my religion in other people's faces. I respected other people. Sadly, I wasn't always shown in the same respect. When I was 22, I started working for 14 months at the McVitie's Biscuit Factory in Edinburgh, polishing the display cabinets. The men there soon noticed me. Yeah, have you seen that new girl, Maggie? Well, she's no bad looking, but uh, I hear she's a real Bible thumper. Like she's a paper, a Catholic. <laughs> Never at the chapel a year. Did you see her face when I was telling that dirty joke? She didn't even crack a smile. One day, I went into the cloakroom and found my hat lying on the floor. Someone had just thrown it there. I can put up with wee things like that for the love of God. But I wasn't afraid to stand up to injustice. I joined the trade union and campaigned for equal pay for women, but left when I realised how much idle chit chat there was at the meetings. It just seemed like a waste of union fees being paid by the workers, so I left it to someone else. I had other battles to fight. One day, I found a picture lying in a heap of rubbish in the factory. It was a picture of our blessed mother Mary. Someone had just tossed it there. I carefully cleaned it up and hung it above my workstation. The next day, I turned up for work and it had been taken down. <laughs> Once again, I picked it up and hung it above my workstation. But the same thing happened the next day. It was like a game. I put it up. They took it down. I put it up. They took it down. Then one day, I came in to find it being turned round facing the wall. I put it back in order and after that, they gave up and left it where it was. Sometimes we worry about what people around us are thinking. We try and hide our faith from the world. But we're so busy worrying about what people might be saying that we miss the ones around us who are happy to see us live out our faith. Like Mr Rankin, who left the factory to go and live in the United States. We had lots of great chats. And when he was leaving, he says that he was going to become a Catholic when he got to the United States. If Catholics gave good example, then other people would come into the church and others would return to their faith. But it starts with us. We can't bring the light into other people's lives unless we keep it alight in ourselves. All things grow. That's the way of things. Gardens can teach us a lot. 
In the Bible, everything started in the garden. And in his parables, Jesus uses stories about plants to make a point. Huh. During the war, Bella and I bought an allotment for 10 shillings. It was on a patch of land bought by St. Patrick's Church. Part of the Dig for Victory campaign to encourage people to grow their own vegetables. <laughs> we won third prize for our cabbages and fourth prize for best attended plot. Bella and I were chuffed about our growing vegetables, but we were growing too. Our social life was developing amongst keen gardeners. We took classes in dressmaking and sewing and cooking. My spiritual life was developing too. I started to make weekly visits to the Church of the Sacred Heart in Lauriston. It was served by the Jesuit order. It was there that I met a priest called Father Thomas Aegis. He was my confessor and became my spiritual director. I went to Holy Communion regularly. Bella wasn't sure about that. But I told her that we don't go because we're good, but because we want to be good. We went on holidays and days out around Scotland. Loch Lomond, Bowness, and Rosewell were our favorite places. It was on one of these trips to Bowness that I met a man called Patrick Lynch. We called him Pete. He was a miner and he took a shine to me. Pete asked me to meet with him. A life of a miner was very tough. He would swear a lot and take the Lord's name in vain. When he asked me to meet with him, I thought maybe our friendship could help him. I told him that if we were going to start meeting, that you'd have to stop swearing and try hard to stop taking the Lord's name in vain. Pete and I started meeting up, and true to his word, he did his best to control his language. We talked about God a lot, and that was important to me and I thought it was becoming important to him. I saw our relationship being about God. But for him, it meant something else. He would cycle from Bowness to Edinburgh to come visit me at my home. My parents seemed to like him. Try as I might, I just didn't see him in that way. I wrote him a letter and tried to tell him that's how I felt, but he didn't seem to take it on board. He just said, I can't live without you. We kept seeing each other. And on my 21st birthday, when we were passing a jeweler shop, he says to me, oh Maggie, let me buy you a ring for your birthday. So I looked at the rings and eventually I gave in. I let him buy me a nice sparkly cluster ring. I liked it enough, but to me it was just a dress ring, something to wear to the dances. But for Pete, it meant much more. I didn't mean to hurt Pete's feelings. I really didn't. I even thought at one point that I could marry him and offer it up to God. But I didn't want to spend the rest of my life with Pete. My heart was troubled. 
I went to speak to Father Aegis. Father, what must I do? I've let this relationship run on far longer than I should have, but I thought I was helping him in his faith. He started going back to mass. He's active in the parish. Our relationship has changed his life. But I just don't have those kind of feelings for him. My parents will be so upset if I don't marry Pete. But to marry him would be a form of martyrdom. Part of me would die. I had talked to my mother too. If you don't want to marry the boy, you'd better be honest with them, Maggie. So I wrote him a letter. And this time, I made it plain to him and left no room for doubt. I'm sorry, Pete. I don't care for you in that way. I tried to tell you last year, but you were so upset. You said that you'd go back to your old ways if I left you. I didn't mean to hurt you. It broke Pete's heart to get that letter. I heard later on that he'd hoped that I'd leave the convent and return to marry him. But by that time, my heart belonged totally to God, and I wanted to be totally His. But how? Not long after that, I attended a series of talks run by the Jesuits. It was there that I first heard about the Poor Clares, an order which was founded by St Francis of Assisi and set up by St Clare. Everything about them captivated my imagination. Mainly their dedication to serving Jesus and the poor. There was a community of the poor players in Liberton in Edinburgh. I went to speak to Father Aegis again. But Maggie, you must realise that the poor players live a hard life of very strict poverty. Marriage is a great vocation and you could serve the church well as a married woman. Would you not rather be married? He was right about the vocation to marriage. I saw the beauty of the sacrament in my parents' relationship and in the love between my brother and his future wife. I'd helped her to become a Catholic and we talked a lot about love. It became clear to me that I was in love with God. I wanted to be totally his. He was my one true love. So, I applied to become a poor player. As usual, the first person I told my news to was my sister Bella. She was my closest confidant, so I wanted her to be the first to know. But, to my surprise, she had her own news to tell me. She was going to become a nun too. She wanted to join the Little Sisters of the Poor. Can you imagine my joy? <laughs> Two sisters who'd grown up together, who'd played together, who'd prayed together, who'd worked together, had both decided to serve God through religious life. But then the sad news hit me. We wouldn't be in the same order. If 
Bella was going to serve the Little Sisters of the Poor and I was going to be with the Poor Clares, then we would be separated. We each try to convince each other to serve in the other order, but our hearts were set. I continued to work at the McVitie's Biscuit Factory as my application was being considered. I started to have all kinds of feelings around that time. I developed a bit of a cough. And mum was sad that her two daughters would be leaving home at the same time. And my brother Andrew had decided to move to America, so it was a lot for my parents to deal with. And then Father Aegis delivered the news. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Margaret, but the poor Clares have written back to say that the convent at Liberton is already full. They can't take in anyone else just now. It seemed like my dreams were crushed. What was I going to do now? I had decided to give my life to God, and I wanted to serve him through the poor Clares, but that seemed impossible now. There is another possibility, Margaret, but it means moving further from home. The poor Clares have another Collatine convent in Notting Hill, London. With my permission, he wrote to them and I was accepted to become a postulant. That's like a trial period to becoming a nun. I made my own religious habit. That was normal, and with my dressmaking classes it made it easy for me. Bella left to join the Little Sisters of the Poor. I set off with my brother Andrew on the train, and we kissed our parents goodbye. Dad took it very badly. Soon I arrived at the convent and everything was different to what I first imagined. The food didn't agree with me. I felt lonely too. And to make matters worse, even my boots didn't match up to expectation. Those brown boots will never do. They must be blackened and the heel must be shortened. Was this really what God wanted? Was this really what I wanted? I searched my soul. And after a few weeks, I got used to the place and got to know the sisters. <laughs> I'd opted to become an exterior sister, working partly in the world, helping to support the nuns enclosed in the order. I would work and pray and beg for donations to help support the convent. The sisters soon got to know my sense of humour and how much I love to laugh. <laughs> I think I raised a few disapproving eyebrows at times, but after six months, I was clothed in the habit of a novice and received my veil just before my 25th birthday. <laughs> Best of all, my family were able to attend the ceremony. Even Bella was able to come. From that day on, I was to be known by my religious name, Sister Mary Frances of the Five Winds, a name which recalls the suffering of Jesus during his passion. The wounds that the nails made in his hands and feet and the wound made in his side by the soldier's lance while his body hung on the cross. I would embrace all my little sufferings as tiny splinters of the same cross and then offer them up to God. Whenever I was asked to do something in the convent, I would always answer with the same reply. I will try. Well, you're never sure if you're able to do something or not. So 
so I'd rather say I'll try. And usually, with God's help, I'm able to manage it. That got on the nerves of some of the sisters there. They thought I was being obstinate. Sometimes things were a wee bit awkward. But I did my best, and I was really happy there. I even had my own patch in the garden, where I had an apple tree that was growing. The most awkward moment that I can remember was when Mother Abbess was celebrating her jubilee and I was asked by her if I could say a few words at the gathering. Sister Mary Frances, please be kind enough to tell the sisters in the convent the story of something that is of interest in the outside world. Hmm. What was I supposed to say? I thought about it all. The developments in the cities. The increase in motor vehicles. The picture houses. But then I thought about the convent. And all its simplicity and calm. In that place there was such a peace and happiness that I'd never felt before. I almost felt like Jesus was standing next to me saying, what could possibly interest you more than this? So, I just said nothing. Years later, people remembered this. Some of them held it against me. I just said nothing. I made my first religious profession at the age of 25. <laughs> it was such a happy occasion. But the happiness I felt at that time was quickly followed by some terrible news that I heard from my mum in a letter from home. Dear Margaret, I have some terrible news to give you. Your father has died. He was sweeping the streets in Edinburgh when a motor vehicle collided with him and caused the handle of the room to crush his ribs, puncture his lung. He walked to the hospital and died in the waiting room. I'm so sorry to have to tell you this. I worried about Mum. I wrote to my sister Lizzie to look out for her. Poor Mum. Not long after hearing this terrible news, my own health was beginning to deteriorate. <coughs> A bad cough was getting worse. <coughs> I was referred to a hospital run by the Sisters of Mercy in Worley, Essex, where my condition quickly got worse. I lay in my peaceful room at the Marillac Hospital in Essex. My health was worse than ever. I had been diagnosed with tuberculosis, a disease that attacks the throat and lungs. Medicine wasn't the same in those days. At only 25 years of age, my final days approached. Visitors would come and go. Bishops and priests would bring me Holy Communion, but it was difficult for me to swallow. 
Some of the sisters from my own convent brought me an apple from my tree in the garden and cooked it for me to eat. My mother came to visit with my brother and sister, John and Lizzie. How Lizzie had grown and matured. I could still make John laugh. Mother looked sad, but I reassured her, I will see you in heaven, Mum. One day while I was resting with the window open, a wasp came in and hovered over the bed. It flew into my mouth and stung me on the tongue. All of these little sufferings were just wee splinters from the cross of Christ. I united them with the sufferings of Jesus who died for me on the cross. I longed for Jesus to come and take me home. I believe that the measure of a life well lived is in how much we love and allow ourselves to be loved. As you have seen from my short life of 25 years, Jesus was my constant companion, choosing me and calling me to go on an adventure with God. It wasn't a perfect life. As you have seen, it was touched by suffering in many ways. But it was a beautiful life. Once God was involved, everything had meaning. My childhood days at school and at play. My family life at home. My working life as a French polisher. My social life, attending the dances and going on trips. My relationship with Patrick Lynch. My call to religious life as a nun. And finally, my invitation to suffer with Christ in my final days. Our Lord told his disciples, in the world you will have trouble, but be cheerful. I have overcome the world. Lord Jesus Christ, my Saviour, my brother, my Redeemer, my friend, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You called me home to you and now that I am with you, I want to help others to know how much you love them. Talk to me. I'll pray for you. Tell me what you need. As I said to my mother when I was a child, you don't have to ask. Just tell me and I'll help you. People around the world began to tell my story. They asked me for help and I helped them. People prayed that the church would recognise me as a saint, and that process has begun. They moved my body and laid it to rest in the Church of St Patrick's in Edinburgh's Cowgate, where I grew up. It was where I made my first sacraments and attended daily Mass. Maybe you could make a pilgrimage there one day and see the artefacts of my life that are on display there. You might say that my life was pretty ordinary when compared to the lives of the saints. But a life lived with God doesn't need to be dramatic and exciting. After all, it's the little things. We things can make a big difference.